Hello, everyone, and welcome to the VCE Zone 7 Gardening Plant Clinic. Today's topic, celebrate native trees valued by wildlife, the black gum tree and the American hornbeam. My name is Linda, your host for today's Zone 7 Gardening presentation on native trees valued by wildlife with the stunning fall colors. The photo on the left is the black gum tree and the photo on the right is the American hornbeam. These series of clinics are sponsored by the Virginia Cooperative Extension Program of Virginia's two land grant universities. Staffing our plant clinics are master gardeners from the Fairfax County Master Gardeners. Today's program includes the following. What's Blooming, Smooth Blue Aster, presented by Pinar, Native Trees Valued by Wildlife, The Black Gum Tree, presented by Elaine, and The American Hornbeam, presented by Elizabeth. All right, Pinar will share with us what's currently blooming in our Zone 7 gardens, the Smooth Blue Aster, an attractive perennial for a pollinator garden or naturalized area in your lawn. Over, you, over to you, Pinar. Thank you, Linda, and hi, everyone. I'm here to talk about what's blooming right now in Zone 7 and many other zones. The Symphiotrichum lave, commonly known as the Smooth Blue Aster, or Blue Aster, is a beautiful fall plant. It's part of the aster family, but one of the more showier varieties due to its gorgeous flowers in the shades of blue to purple. The blue aster is an herbaceous perennial plant, and it's native to a large swath of Northern America. Almost anything to the east of the Rockies is, is where it grows. And it's it's a great option for any fall garden because it bridges that bloom time between the summer and the spring. It has beautiful flowers that last four to six weeks, starting from late August to September. And here you can really see flowers of the blue aster. They, once they bloom, the flowers initially have a, a blue shade. And as the season progresses, the petals turn to a, a more purplish shade than blue. It is an easy plant to grow. They, they don't need much upkeep once they're established. They do want full sun. They can do well in partial shade, but they will prefer full sun. They grow well in well-drained average garden soil, and once established, they can tolerate droughts. In terms of soil, they're pretty easy to maintain. They can grow in clay, loam, and sand. And the biggest well, apart from their beautiful flowers, the <laughs> biggest benefit in of the blue aster is they're great for pollinators. In a time where not much is in bloom for the butterflies to, to use, the blue aster is a great option. Their long bloom period in the fall benefits all sorts of pollinators. It's a, the blue aster produces nectar and pollen. So they're attractive to bees, butterflies, pollinators, small mammals, and songbirds. The plant can grow from two to four feet tall. So as such, they're a great choice for use in borders and are obviously a great choice for pollinator gardens and butterfly gardens. And here are the references I used. If you have any more questions, you can refer to these uh, sites. I thought they were very, very helpful. Thank you.
Is there any reference that you'd like to point out to the folks online that you really, really liked? I um, um North Carolina Extension Gardener Plant Toolbox, I found to be very easy to use. I like how they set up their website. You can quickly see the information on the plant and how, what it needs, what kind of pollinator it attracts. And it's generally very easy to use. Yes, that's one of my go-to sites as well. I find it particularly useful. Um, well, well, thank you. And indeed, that the aster is a great addition to our fall, fall gardens. It's easy to grow, loved by bees, butterflies, and songbirds. What a great choice for our Zone 7 gardens. Thank you for sharing. Next, we're going to turn to our topic for today. Native trees valued by wildlife with stunning fall colors. Look at the stunning fall color here of the, the black gum. So um, over to Elaine for part one, the black gum tree. Thank you, Linda. This is Savatica is a relatively pest-free tree that has four seasons of interest and absolutely excellent fall color. Nissa refers to the Greek, is the Greek name for water nymph because it grows in or near wet areas. Selvatica means of the woods. The species has a few common names, black gum for both its dark green leaves and its dark bark. Black tupelo is a Creek Indian name, which means swamp tree, and sour gum relates to the sour taste of the edible seeds. If you look at this, it is a tree that grows about 30 to 50 feet in height by 20 to 30 foot spread. It's slow growing and long lived. When it's young, it's more pyramidal shape, it has horizontal branches, more pyramidal. And as it gets older, it becomes more, more rounded. This is my tree in my front yard. We had a, a talk one time and talked about how good native trees are, especially black gum, especially for good bugs. So I had to have one. <laughs> and they say it's hard to plant, but this is one that's been in the ground about three years. You can see it was it was two and a half inch calipers when it was when it was purchased. I didn't have any problems transplanting it. The only problem I have is if you notice, I don't have fruit. You need more than one to have fruit. So maybe someday one of my neighbors will plant one as, as well. And when the cicadas came by, I, I covered it and then now it's not quite as horizontal anymore. It got a little bit droopy, but it'll perk up in, in time. Again, here's the information on the characteristics. It does like full sun to part shade, even though it tolerates shade. In some areas, it can be found under oaks and pine trees, which is amazing to me. Soil moisture, it, it's very adaptive, wide range. And the, oddly enough, it doesn't like acidic soils, but pretty much anything else, including standing water, is, is fine. And it, it actually tolerates wind and ice well, which I appreciate during some of the windstorms that we've had this winter. It goes through zones in nine. And its native range is along streams, and it's also in upland areas. In Fairfax County, there's a, a chart in something called the Public Facilities Manual. In chapter 12, it talks about endangered and unique forest species, forest, forest communities. There's something at the fall line, which is roughly along the interstate of 95. You can find a forest association of black gum, sweet, bot, sweet bay, pitch pine, swamp azalea, poison shumac, and bamboo vine woodland. So it's natural in Fairfax County there. And then in the tidal area in the east end of the county, you can find it in a forest associated community called pumpkin ash swamp, black gum, green ash, common winterberry, houseburg leaf, tear thumb forest. So if you ever have time for a little bit of dry reading, you can go to the public facilities mail in chapter 12 and look at that and look at that area. And here's a more detailed information, 
look on my of uh, uh, mine, it's alternate leaves, and you can see it's kind of rounded it out at the end, and there are no teeth on it. It's deeply ridged bark when it's mature, and the bark can be brown, gray, all the way to black. Is you need separate plants, male and female, to get the, the plant, the, the fruits. That's the flowers are normally in April and June. You can barely see them on the plant, but, but they are there. And then you get the black troops, which could be dark blue or black. And they come in around October, September, October, and they're about half inch in the length. Excellent fall color. Oh my goodness, let me tell you about the fall color. In Michael Durr's book, he talks about the fall color. And if, he said, if it wasn't for difficulty to transplant it, he listed as the five best fall colors of all time. This is unique because you have orange or you could have red, mine is red, but you could also have fluorescent yellow, maroon, or scarlet. I mean, it's just all, sorts of variation. And if you, you can see them in a cluster in the forest, you may see a, one of each in, in, in a grouping and it's just absolutely magnificent. Has a lot of wildlife benefits. There's honey that people make out of it. And then the dark blue fruit is eaten by a number of wildlife. It is not deer resistant. No, it's the white-tailed deer and, and beavers do like the twigs, foliage, and young, young, young sprouts. And the fruit is edible. It's very sour, but it has a large seed, but some people make them into preserves. Landscape use has a lot of different uses. I used it as both a specimen tree, a shade tree, and a street tree, because mine's in my front yard. You can use it in natural areas or screening. And Fairfax County, back again to the public facility manual, has a chart on trees and it gives it high points for a native tree, for energy conservation and water quality. Now, the one thing that says the fruit drop, if you get fruit, may be undesirable on paved areas, but there are fruiting cultivar, there are non-fruiting cultivars that are available now. One is called Fire Starter and another is Red Rage. So if you uh, putting it next to your driveway or in a next to your patio, maybe you would want that. It is a good substitute for Bradford pear many years ago because it's four seeds of interest. Everyone loved it. Then they found out once it grew up, it dropped limbs. It's literally weak wooded, but they didn't know that back then. This is one that's superior to that. It's a native tree. It's not invasive. It's larger and it's a much sturdier tree. Pest, it has few pests or diseases. It's literally listed on Virginia Tech's list of problem-free trees for Virginia. It does have some susceptibility to leaf spots, canker, and rust. There are some cultivars they're working on to get, get off the leaf spot. Uh, Green Gable and Red Rage are, are very highly resistant to leaf spot. And I don't know if you noticed, but back when we were talking about fruit, that particular sample had a little bit of leaf spot, but it's fairly pest, fairly pest resistant. Not much really bothers it. It is, they keep on telling me it's difficult to plant, to transplant, but you need to plant when it's young and there is little pruning needed. I haven't pruned mine yet. And then I have a list of references here. Elaine, is there any references that you'd like to point out to the folks online? Well, one that is most people don't think about is the public facilities manual. That's that's when there, if you go into chapter 12, it does get into some of the plants. If you're a developer, you're going to be looking at that a lot, but that's something homeowners generally don't think to look at. So you just type 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 in Fairfax County, then go to public facilities manual. A number of these also had uh, listed possible cultivars. So that would be good to look on if you wanna actually find more details than I have time to go through today on cultivars that are available. All right, well, thank you very much. That is a spectacular fall colors. <laughs> Plus mm -hmm. so many benefits, as you said. So Elaine, thank you for sharing. 
All right, next to part two of the native trees valued by wildlife with the stunning fall colors. Elizabeth is going to share us information on the American hornbeam. Over to you, Elizabeth. Hi, um, I'm very happy to be able to talk about American hornbeam. The first time I, I had a chance to identify the tree, I was with Ann Mason on one of her tree, tree identification tours last year. And we just took a walk past it. And now I've had a chance to really delve into this tree and find out more about it. As you can see, it's quite a lovely tree from the, the picture on the left. It's a symmetrical if pruned that way. And the middle picture shows the tree in winter. And then of course, the far right slide shows the tree in full autumn color. And yes, it is very vibrant in color. The American hornbeam is Carpinus caroliniana. It's also known as musclewood, ironwood, blue beech, and water beech. And I found out from our conversation before we started our virtual clinic today that if you want an American hornbeam and are going to this, the nursery to get one, it's best to identify it as American hornbeam or the Latin name because there are other trees that are nicknamed musclewood iron, and ironwood as well. But the names muscle, musclewood and ironwood are certainly good nicknames for this tree. It is a short stubby tree with multiple trunks, slow growing, and it grows to be 20 to 30 feet tall, which is really not that tall for a tree and is 20 to 25 feet wide. It's recognizable by a bluish gray bark resembling musculature. It's smooth and heavy fluted. It has an extremely hard wood used by settlers to make highly polished bones, tool handles, and ox, ox yokes. And some of these implements have been found in some of the archeological digs that have occurred in Virginia and elsewhere through zone seven. The commercial use is impractical as the, the trees are too short to provide much wood. And in this picture, I would like to note that you can see the tree bark, which looks like a tree with abs or at least <laughs> muscle definition of some, some kind. It is a deciduous tree in the beech family, native to Eastern USA zones three to nine. It's an adaptable species and can, can withstand occasional mild flooding, but can also tolerate drier sites. The wild trees can lean a little bit as they are growing in forests with other trees and they're, they're um, leaning to, to capture available light and are often multi-stemmed and low branched. Cultivated trees can be shaped to develop a symmetrical canopy. It's found in naturally moist areas, including stream banks, river banks, and maritime forests. It does best in sandy or, say, or sandy or clay loams with high organic matter. It's good in heavy shade and is an understory tree in dense forests. And I think that's why we found one on our walk through a Fairfax Station subdivision last year because it is a heavily shaded area and this would be just an understory tree. It is difficult to transplant, but best moved in the spring, sensitive to heat, drought, and soil compaction, and it is moderately deer resistant, which means the deer will eat it anyway. <laughs> okay, the species is, is monoecious with male and female catkins on the same tree, and the flowers appear in the spring currently with the leaf out. It's um, pollinated by wind and the flower blooms emerge before the spring foliage finishes expanding. The flowers look like, as you can see from the photo, they look like dangling ornaments. And then they mature into winged green sea clusters that are pale as they mature and turn tan by autumn. The wildlife benefits are significant the songbirds feed on the buds, the catkins, and the mature seeds. And the fallen seeds support ground feeding birds, ruffled grouse, northern bobwhite, wild turkey, and wood duck. The seeds are also a good source of food for squirrels. 
Now, peculiar to the American hornbeam is that they are a foliage host for the Eastern tiger swallowtail. And I've, I learned through my research often, you can find whole trees covered by these butterflies. They also host the striped hair streak butterflies plus se spe several species of moths. Insects and disease damage is not a serious problem. When you have their recreational use in forested campgrounds, it increases exposure to disease infection, insect infestation, and decline. They also have leaf spot cankers and twig. They, to they tolerate pruning without problems. Desired pruning should be limited to winter when possible to avoid a lot of sap bleeding. Lowest branch branches should be removed gradually to define shape and trunk of tree. Landscape use, uh, life friendly, pollinator garden, children, children or native tree. Uh, four season interest with red leaves in spring, hanging flowers in the spring, summer, yellow to orange, red and purple color in the, in the fall. A great candidate for landscapes with shade for canopy trees or buildings in less than drainage. And again, I, I apologize. Few cultivars exist for the species, with most selected to have enhanced leaf color. And one of these is the JN upright or fire spire, which is yellow and orange. Another is called Walter. In addition to the usual uh, North Carolina extension garden plant, toolbox. I really liked what I found from the University of Maryland Extension, specifically the Maryland Biodiversity Project Gallery. <laughs> and I'm going to stop torturing you with uh, <laughs> this very interesting tree. And I hope you have a chance to find out more about it. All right. Well, thank you, Elizabeth. Get something to drink there. The American hornbeam, like the black gum has such beautiful colors, all those pollinators. I can't imagine seeing a tree covered with all those butterflies, it must be gorgeous. So thank you for sharing today. Let's go to questions submitted during registration. We got one question. Is there a way to watch previous meetings that I missed? Yes, we have a YouTube channel. So check out our YouTube channel. You search for VCE Fairfax County YouTube in your browser, and we've been recording these the past two years. So along with our session here with Zone 7, there's also all about veggies. And the year before, we had landscaping, virtual plant clinics, and a number of others as well. So check out, check out our YouTube site. Here's some gardener's tips for late October. Okay, now is a great time to begin your fall cleanup, remove spent annuals and veggies and turn over the soil. Discard, don't compost any plant materials that are diseased or insect infested to sanitize your garden. So, okay, so don't put them in the compost pile, put them in your trash. Remember to leave some dead plant stalks branches, leaves, and a portion of your garden. Natural material provides winter shelter for pollinators, butterflies, moths, and other arthropods that are essential for the environment. Now is a good time to prepare uh, beds for fall and spring planting. You can still plant your spring bulbs, edge and weed existing beds, refresh your mulch, Mulch helps to protect your perennials, your shrubs, your trees from uh, frost heaving caused by freezing and thawing of the soil. And mulch helps moderate the temperature fluctuations and reduces this problem. Also save time and effort of raking, blowing and picking up your leaves. Leaves are a valuable source of organic matter to improve the soil in your lawn and your garden. Leaves that fall onto the lawn can be shredded with a lawnmower and left to decompose naturally in place. 
and they provide nutrients to, to your soil. Fallen leaves also make excellent mulch for garden beds. Shred them first by running over them with a mulching mower or a leaf shredder. For more information after today's clinic, check out our Fairfax County Master Gardeners website. You can subscribe by email to receive notices when our site is updated. You can follow us on Instagram at fairfax.master.gardeners. Thank you for attending and happy gardening.